Today we will cover sections 51 through 56 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's start here with some background. In late December 1830 and early January 1831, the Prophet Joseph Smith received revelations from the Lord instructing the saints to gather in Ohio. The Colesville branch, consisting of more than 60 church members, was one of the three groups of saints to leave New York to gather in Ohio. They departed from Colesville, New York, in mid-April 1831 with Newell Knight as their leader. After a long journey that included delays due to inclement weather, they arrived in Ohio about mid-May. According to Newell Knight, when they arrived, it was advised that the Colesville branch remain together and go to a neighboring town called Thompson, as a man by the name of Lehman Copley owned a considerable tract of land there, which he offered to let the brethren occupy. Bishop Edward Partridge sought instruction on how to provide for the newly arrived saints. So Joseph Smith inquired of the Lord. In response, on May 20th, 1831, the prophet received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 51. Much of the information in the sections that we will be covering today, the Lord has brought up previously. And so we won't be covering every verse, of course. We'll try to pick out some principles here that maybe could be re-emphasized or maybe even new. So let's go directly to verse 3, where the Lord said to Joseph Smith concerning at Bishop Partridge, Wherefore let my servant Edward Partridge and those whom he has chosen, in whom I am well pleased. Now this is a phrase I want to come back to. In whom I am well pleased, appoint unto this people their portions, every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. Again, we go to another verse in section 82 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which we have not yet arrived at, where the Lord makes this very clear. In verse 17 of that section, he says, And you are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardships, every man according to his wants and needs, insomuch as his wants are just. We have discussed this in previous lessons, particularly section 42, when we were covering the introduction to the law of consecration. But we need to really understand that this is not a law where everyone gets just exactly the same acreage, exactly the same size house with exactly the same number of bedrooms and so forth. No, it's not like that. The Lord sees that all of our circumstances are different and that our needs are different and also our wants are different. And once the law of consecration is well established and people are in the law who are honorable and work hard and fulfill their stewardships as they should, it becomes an extremely prosperous society to the point where individual wants for one person may have certain interest where he would want something where the person next door would have different wants because he has different interests. As the society progresses, those wants can be fulfilled as long as it is done in righteousness and people do not drift over into that state we call pride or which the Lord calls pride. Now I'd like to come back to that one phrase, in whom I am well pleased. We heard those words before. We've heard them in the first vision when our Father in heaven was speaking of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we would think, oh, well, that only applies to Christ. It certainly does because he has been perfectly obedient in every way to our Father in heaven. But this statement in verse 3 opens the door that, yes, this can apply not only to Bishop Partridge, but to you and to me. 
And I guess the question could be asked, well, what must be done to be a person with whom the Lord is well pleased, with whom our Father in heaven is well pleased? I think the answer is really simple. It's only people who make it complex. The answer is simple, to be humble before the Lord, to get rid of all pride, to get rid of anything that we would have, that we would say, oh yes, I believe, but, to get rid of that word, that word but, and to not put any contingencies on our love and our obedience and the blessings we are willing to receive from the Lord and to what he asks of us. And then when he asks something of us, to go to with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength with the blessings and gifts and talents the Lord has given each one of us. And as we continue to do that with a humble heart, loving him above all, and therefore loving others with that perspective, I think such a person will be in a very, very good position to have that statement apply to them, where the Lord can say to that individual, to you and to me, that he is well pleased. Let's go over to verse 5 and also verse 6. It's interesting, when Joseph Smith had this revelation recorded as he dictated it, that the original dictation was different in verse 5 and verse 6. Remember, well, let me just give a little background here. Let's read just this first paragraph here. Verse 5 was not a part of the original revelation. The current verse 5 clarifies procedure of title. Previously, if one was excommunicated, he lost all his properties. In other words, a person comes into the church, they have financial holdings, they have property, maybe they have a home. They consecrate all that to the church, and it goes into the hands of the bishop. The bishop, in about every case, the bishop would in turn turn those properties back to the same individual. And instead of them being the sole owners of that property, it is their stewardship and God is the owner. So they maintain the same property, but just the concept, the eternal principle of it all has shifted from I'm the owner to God is the owner and I am the stewardship over this blessing God has given me. Well, remember a few sections ago, we read about a man by the name of Bates who had entered into the law of consecration, had consecrated his properties to the church, and then he apostatized. And he wanted his properties back and the church said, no, you have consecrated them to the Lord. Well, Bates took it to court and so we go on and it says, in the bait suit, the court ruled against the church. So, in verse 5, what we read now in this section, it says this clarification resolves the problem caused by weaknesses of men. We need to go back and think this through just a little bit. People who do not know the Lord and how he works have made accusations about this verse and other verses in the Doctrine and Covenants, supposing that Joseph Smith just willy-nilly can just change verses according to his whims. And they say, therefore, he is not a prophet of God. Little do they know the way God operates and who he is. All they need to do is go back and study the Bible if they believe in the Bible. They will find that God has seen people not live up to the principles and commandments and covenants they have given him. And then the Lord changes what he expects of the people because he realizes the people are not willing to live that. All we have to do, as we've brought up before, is go back to the days of Moses. When God gave Moses the higher law that has mostly been established today in our time. 
But when he came down from the mount and saw that the people were worshipping the golden calf and were so far away from anything of the higher law that God was asking them to live, Moses cast down the tablets. And eventually the Lord gave a different law. It was the lower law. And from that time all the way to the time of Christ, Israel was under the directive of that lower law because they were not ready to live the higher law. So we see in that incident where God removed what was originally written and then installed another writing to replace what he had written before to meet the level of acceptance of the people. Remember, when we go over to Alma, chapter 29, verses 4 through 5, we are reminded that God blesses us according to our desires, whether they be good or evil. And so just because we see verse 5 in this section does not mean it's a compliment to the members of the church. It is that the Lord says, okay, I guess you're not willing to live this hard law, especially when the Lord commands that we should live by the laws of the land. And now the law of the land makes it illegal for the church to hold that the actual properties that were consecrated. So instead of giving a brand new revelation on this, the Lord simply reveals to the prophet an update wording to how it should now read because of that legal proceeding. So here is how verse 5 and 6 now read as directed by the Lord to the prophet and then put in the later editions of the Doctrine and Covenants. And if he shall transgress, talking about a person who has entered into the law of consecration and is not accounted worthy to belong to the church, he shall not have power to claim that portion which he has consecrated under the bishop for the poor and needy of my church, which would include tithings and fast offerings. Therefore, he shall not retain the gift, but shall only have claim on that portion that is deeded unto him. In other words, when he consecrated his property, his home, to the church, and then it was deeded back to him as a stewardship, that property he can have claim on in the, under the law of consecration because of that court ruling. So then comes verse 6, And thus all things shall be made sure according to the laws of the land. In verse 10, it's just a, a small little note here where the Lord says, And let that which belongeth to this people not be taken and given unto that of another church. Another church, that does not, not mean an, another denomination. It just means another branch of the church. And of course, if it was to be given to another branch, the two branches or wards or stakes would work it out with the leadership of the church, maybe to balance such as fast offering funds or how to help people in general. But it is to be done under an organized manner, not just passed off from one to the other. Over here in verse 13 comes a very, very important verse. Why? Because it's such a vital part of the function of the Lord's church today and always. Verse 13, and again, let the bishop appoint a storehouse unto this church, and let all things, both in money and in meat, which are more than is needful for the wants of this people, be kept in the hands of the bishop. Well, maybe we could take time to just learn a little bit about how this functions today. If you go to the church website, you can look under the bishop storehouse and see the information they have there. Let me just give you an example. This is just an overview, and I just downloaded this yesterday, so this is very current, unless they changed it from yesterday, but uh, I think this is the way it still reads today and for a long time. It has a purpose. The purpose of the bishop's storehouse, it says, Bishop storehouses distribute commodities to the poor and needy as requested by bishops. Bishop storehouses also provide meaningful service opportunities for those receiving assistance and for those desiring to serve missions or to volunteer. 
The role of the storehouse is outlined in the Doctrine and Covenants. And again, let the bishop appoint a storehouse under this church, and let all things, both in money and in meat, which are more than is needful for the wants of this people, be kept in the hands of the bishop. And look at the verse it quotes, the very verse we were just in, Doctrine and Covenants 51.13. And then it talks about welfare principles. These are very important. Oftentimes, people have certain wants and needs, and they don't need to go to the bishop because friends and family are willing to help, and that works out very well. And it should be, especially the family, should be the first source. And so these principles would apply even on that level. But if a person finds that it is best to go to the bishop, here are some guidelines that are to be followed. So let's just look at the highlighted parts. As bishops care for the poor and needy, they should. And then here are the bullet points of principles. Isn't this interesting? The bishops are to seek out the poor. And the bishop is to promote personal responsibility. Over on the left, we are so well aware now of the church's self-reliance program that we see that those principles are built into the instructions for the bishops concerning welfare principles and all those assisting the bishop. So they are to promote personal responsibility, that self-reliance. The bishop's outlook on this is to help sustain life, comma, not life style. That is very important. The next one is provide commodities before cash. That's very wise. I think we've all had the experience of learning that just cash handouts, sometimes that cash isn't used for the most wise purpose to help that person get out of their problem. Oftentimes cash is misused. But commodities are so much better because they directly help in needs. And oftentimes, when people can pick up food and supplies, it enables them to have extra money instead of spending at the grocery store to help them get out of the financial problems they're in or out of certain debts and so forth. So providing commodities before cash can really be a great service to people in need. And then here we come back to a self-reliance principle. And that is that the bishop is to have in mind to help give work opportunities to people who need assistance. I'd like to share with you a film that the church has put together to help us understand the blessings and benefit of the bishop's storehouse. If you go to the church's website, you'll see that they have three films and probably even more in other places. This film may be familiar, maybe some of you have seen it in the stewardships and callings that you have had, but for those who haven't, let's go ahead and let us watch it again. We're the Foot family. We live here in Simi Valley, California. We have three kids right now and one on the way. One of the aspects that I think I love most about my little family is the love that we all share together. We're a close family. When I was younger, I kind of figured out I had a knack for doing murals and doing characters on walls. So I thought, well, I'll take a leap of faith and start my own business. For many years, it was wonderful, but the economy took a turn for the worse and things were getting very tight. And then there was times where the month was coming to an end and we still didn't have all the bills paid. The moment that we actually realized together that we are financially s struggling and we're not gonna make it. His first thought was, what am I gonna do for my family? How am I gonna take care of my family? As a husband, as a father, we all have that desire in our hearts to give all that we can to those that we love. From that standpoint, it's not an easy thing to, to swallow when you feel that you've failed. You feel that uh, the world is crashing around you, especially when you've tried so hard to build something. 
We are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we do have a welfare system to help when needed, but the church does teach we do need to look first to ourselves. If we're doing all we can to better our situation, what can our family, our immediate family, do to help? When we saw that we had gone to a family and we had gotten all that we could, we found the need then to make an appointment with the bishop. One of my responsibilities in the ward is to seek out the poor and needy. The Foote family came to me and explained their situation. And as we went through the details of their finances and found out their needs, I was anxious to be able to help. I love Bishop Heim. He is amazing. He, he, I know that he has been called of God. My wife and I would go and uh, counsel with him. And when we didn't feel great about ourselves because of the situation that we were in, we would feel that he was pouring love to us, that he spiritually lifted us. He treated me, uh, I think, just as well as I think the Savior would have. One of the resources bishops have to help those that need help is the bishop's storehouse. It's just like a grocery store, and when a family has needs, we fill out a food order. The money that would normally go to food can now go to other bills. The church is very unique in that we produce a lot of our own food. We have farms and ranches. Labor is provided by donations of members of the church. And so it's a very low cost, efficient way to help feed the people that are in need. We're here at the Bishop's Storehouse in Silmar, California, one of many in the world. We grow and can a lot of quality food. We try to give out the best. We have our own milk plant. We make our own butter, cheese, stews, and chili, powdered milk, drink mix, tomato juice, spaghetti sauce, all in canneries done by volunteers. It's all part of the Lord's program, people helping people. The first order that I got, I was thinking, wow, I can't believe the church can provide so much food to families. There's hope there. There's gratefulness. The way that this welfare system that we have in the church works is through the vast offerings from the members of the church. We abstain from eating two meals a month and we contribute the money we would have spent on that food to a fund which the bishops use to provide for those that are in need. It's an offering of love. Are you willing to go hungry for a meal so that someone else can eat? Um, I think most people are willing to do that. On an individual basis, it doesn't seem like much, but if you have a million people do that, it's very powerful. Knowing that this food has been prepared from the donations of your brothers and sisters, and it's been done with love. It's something that I don't take lightly. When people are receiving assistance, we usually ask them to help out in ways that they're able to help out. We'll ask them to help at the Bishop's Storehouse in filling orders. It's a good opportunity for people to do what they can do. I want to uh, step up and get everything taken care of so that I can uh, be a help to someone else uh, that may be coming down the road. The welfare program is not just for members of the church. There are many people that are not members of the church that love to contribute and to serve and participate in the farm assignments and the other assignments. And there are also those that need help and receive assistance. I know people who are not members of our, our church who have needed help, and the church is there to help them. The Savior taught us to lift up the feeble knees, to help those that are in need, to watch over each other and watch out for each other. And so this is fulfilling the mission that he gave to each of us. It has been evident to me and my wife and my family that the welfare system that we have in the, in the church is so inspired and has helped my family and, and will continue to help others. It is there to give comfort and to give assurance that the Lord is there and mindful of us. But the Bishop Storehouse is a blessing to so many, many people in the church. And the Lord wants his people to have help and to be strong. And if they are in difficult situations, to receive the help where they can recover and become a self-sustaining people and become strong and more capable of then helping others. 
Let's now go over here to verse 16, where the Lord said, And I consecrate unto them this land. This again is talking about the people, the Colesville saints, who were assigned to live on Lehman Copley's property. And it's so interesting, the Lord's wording here. And I consecrate unto them this land for a little season, until I, the Lord, shall provide for them otherwise, and command them to go hence. Well, that's interesting here. They probably thought, well, I thought we were gathered here to Kirtland. I thought this was going to be our home for a long time. Well, the Lord had a greater plan in mind. We've seen that phrase before, little season. And we have learned that a little season can be as long as 2,000 years. But let's take a look at this note here. Because Lehman Copley's faith wavered and he broke his covenant to consecrate his land, the Colesville Saints occupied his farm in Thompson, Ohio for only a few weeks. Doctrine and Covenants 51.16 indicates that the Lord was aware that their stay would be just for a little season. So this time, little season is a few weeks where and other occasions, it can be as long as 2,000 years. So when the Lord uses the words little season, we need to rely on him and watch for his timing. It is a very general phrase that could mean so many different things, and he wisely uses it for his purposes, sometimes just to, I guess, try the faith of his people. There's a reason for this. We will later understand, probably as we continue to mature or even when we get on the other side of the veil. Anyway, it says, Nevertheless, he counseled the saints to work and to live as though they would be there for years. The majority of the Colville saints followed these instructions. During their short stay, they cleared land planted crops, and began to build homes, all of which they left behind when Lehman Copley demanded that they leave. The Lord later instructed the Colesville branch to move to Missouri to help lay the foundation of Zion. In closing out this section, we come to verse 19. And whoso has found a faithful, a just, and a wise steward shall enter into the joy of his Lord and shall inherit eternal life. To those with very little faith, if they were under the circumstances of the Colesville branch there on the Copley farm, and then were expelled, this verse still applies to them. To those who were faithful in doing their stewardships, even though their stewardships on that piece of real estate didn't last very long, they have great blessings in store for them. Whatever our stewardship is, whether it be long or whether it be short, if we are faithful, if we are just, and if we are wise in that stewardship, we will be blessed. Elder Quentin L. Cook said, We live in perilous times when many believe we are not accountable to God and that we do not have personal responsibility or stewardship for ourselves or others. Many in the world are focused on self-gratification, put themselves first, and love pleasures more than they love righteousness. They do not believe they are their brother's keeper. In the church, however, we believe that these stewardships are a sacred trust. The principles of accountability and stewardship have great significance in our doctrine. In the church, stewardship is not limited to a temple trust or responsibility. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, We are stewards over our bodies, minds, families, and properties. A faithful steward is one who exercises righteous dominion, cares for his own, and looks to the poor and needy. With respect to our stewardship for our families, some have taught that when we report to the Savior and he asks us to give an account of our earthly responsibilities, two important inquiries will relate to our families. The first will be our relationship with our spouse. 
and the second will be about each of our children. In all of our stewardship efforts, we follow Jesus Christ. We try to emulate what he has asked us to do, both by his teachings and his example. Let's now go on to section 52. Let me just look at verse 20 before we move on. The Lord says that he comes quickly. Let's give some perspective. This also kind of goes in the same principle as little season. The Lord uses it as he chooses. And what he means by it is something for us to catch up to and have faith in his definition, not our mortal temporal definition. Because we can go clear back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. This is the great revelation where he's talking about the end of the world and this his second coming. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Well, because of things like this, people of the church thought, well, that means he's coming in three or four months. And Paul had to write them a letter in Second Thessalonians saying, no, no, don't hit the panic button here. He will not come unless there is an apostasy first and then a restoration of the gospel, which implied great periods of time. Revelation 22, just at the very last chapter in Revelation, the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Then in the same chapter, a few verses later, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So anciently, he used the same phrase that he cometh quickly. He says that he will come quickly to his temple. Well, there on April 3rd, 1836, all of a sudden, there he stood in front of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cadry. He came quickly. In other ways, every one of us, when that time comes for us to transfer from mortality into the spirit world, in Alma chapter 40, verse 11 and 12, we find out that every man, whether they are good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And here they will find they are standing quickly before our Savior. And then, whatever takes place there, a decision is made as to where that person will reside in the spirit world as they wait for their resurrection. Well, let's now go to section 52. Let's take a look at a little background here. Let's just look at the blue part. This is a gathering at a conference. And it was during this conference that this revelation was given. But there's some interesting things about that conference. It's recorded that during the conference, the Lord displayed his power to the most perfect satisfaction of the saints. Several testified that they saw God in vision during the meeting. Lyman White said that he witnessed the visible manifestations of the power of God as plain as could have been on the day of Pentecost which included the healing of the sick, casting out devils, speaking in unknown tongues, discerning of spirits, and prophesying with mighty power. Church historian John Whitmer wrote, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon Joseph and in an unusual manner, and Joseph prophesied that John the Revelator was then among the ten tribes of Israel to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion. Also, during the conference, the prophet Joseph Smith ordained some elders to the office of high priest. These were the first ordinations to the office of high priest in the restored church. The prophet declared, It was clearly evident that the Lord gave us power in proportion to the work to be done, and the strength according to the race set before us, and grace and help as our needs required. Although church members at the conference had joyful spiritual experiences, John Whitmer recorded that the adversary was also present. While the Lord poured out his Spirit upon his servants, the devil took occasion to make known his power and he bound Harvey Whitlock so that he could not speak. 
The Lord revealed the design of the adversary to the prophet, and Joseph commanded the devil in the name of Christ, and he departed to our joy and comfort. On the last day of the conference, June 6th, the prophet Joseph Smith received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 52. A few years later, he wrote in a church newspaper that this revelation had been received by an heavenly vision. Let's go to verses 2 and 3. I, the Lord, will make known unto you what I will that ye shall do from this time until the next conference, which shall be held in Missouri, upon the land which I will consecrate unto my people, which are a remnant of Jacob and those who are heirs according to the covenant. Again, as we said last week, whenever we see Jacob and the Lord referring to Jacob or a remnant of Jacob, remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So the Lord is saying, my people who are a remnant of Israel. In other words, they have in their veins the blood of Israel. Now, it's interesting that in the very early days, as people were gathering to Kirtland, the Lord is now telling them there is going to be another place. So what other, other place was that? Well, we kind of jump ahead to section 57. And the Lord says, And thus saith the Lord your God, Behold the place which is now called Independence, which we know is Independence, Missouri, is the center place. And a spot for the temple is lying westward upon a lot which is not far from the courthouse. Over here in verse 9, and by the way, these verses here, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 7, the Lord is calling several men in the church to make a journey to this place, which at the time it was known to be close to where Zion would be built, but they didn't know the exact place but it's later revealed when they actually arrive there. So here is a list of men who were called to that. And it's interesting that as they were to make that journey, verse 9, it says, Let them journey from thence, preaching the word by the way, saying none other things than that which the apostles and prophets have written, and that which is taught them by the Comforter. I guess that can apply to us. As we go along our way in our journeys, whether it be in business or whatever it is that we're involved in, that we could be praying for opportunities to come across people who are ready to hear the gospel, that we can share the gospel with them, that they also can join in with this wonderful Latter-day Restored blessing of the fullness of the gospel. Over here in verse 12, the Lord speak specifically about Lyman White. What a character. It's so interesting. If you would like to be able to access a quick synopsis of the lives of people that we read about in the Doctrine and Covenants, I would highly recommend the book by Susan Easton Black called Who's Who in the Doctrine and Covenants. Lyman was a very energetic man. He was devoted and faithful to the prophet Joseph Smith, and he expended a tremendous amount of energy to fulfill his callings and to fulfill them very well. However, notice here in verse 12, and let my servant Lyman White beware, for Satan desireth to sift him as chaff. It's interesting when the Lord makes a statement like that. I guess we could go back and read our patriarchal blessings and see if there are any warnings to us. Sometimes warnings to people when we read them in the Doctrine and Covenants are only just a few words, almost mentioned in passing. Yet they end up playing out a very significant force in the lives of people, like the warnings given to Oliver Cowdery to beware of his pride. Also, other members of the church and leaders of the church, the Lord gave them warnings. And immediately it didn't seem to be a problem. But down the road, years later, the very thing that the Lord states became a great trial to those individuals. And with some of them, they allowed that trial to overcome them. 
In other words, their own personal pride, therefore their own personal way of looking at things, their own personal interpretations of what the gospel means in their lives and so forth, overcame God's living word and the direction and example of God's prophet. And they ended up stepping away from the church. So it was with Lyman White, such a faithful, wonderful man, but he had his issues. He was chastened several times during his life. In fact, even brought before the high council. But he would repent and get himself back in line, and then he'd get out of line, and then he'd be called back to repentance, and he would repent. He eventually was called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He was in Liberty Jail with Joseph Smith all those months. He stood by Joseph Smith's side and and defended him greatly. But in the end, after Joseph was killed, have you ever heard people say of a past president, oh, he was my prophet? Well, that's good. They love that prophet so much. But there's danger in those words. They love that prophet more than they love the current prophet. And if that's the case, there is potential danger where they could drift away. And it seemed to be the case with Lyman White. Because when the Quorum of the Twelve, under the leadership of Brigham Young, sought to complete the Nauvoo Temple, then lead the saints west to the Salt Lake Valley, Lyman White would not follow or be a part of that. Instead, he moved to Texas and beckoned several saints to go with him who believed in his reasoning. And he went down there and settled in a little area, and he tried to be their leader. Finally, when Brigham Young and and the rest arrived in the Salt Lake Valley, Lyman White was excommunicated from the church because Joseph was Lyman's prophet, and he would not follow the Lord's current living prophet. So here is the warning, Satan desireth to sift him as chaff. Who would ever know that it would be something so subtle as that one issue? Then in verse 13, And behold, he that is faithful shall be made ruler over many things. There are a lot of people in the church who are extremely faithful in the callings. They're never called to serve as a bishop. They're never called to serve as a stake president or in the Quorum of Seventy. Yet they are faithful in their callings. So what can this mean, that they shall be made ruler over many things? They didn't serve as bishop or stake president. Let's take a look at some scriptural references that may give some dimension to all this. Here in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23, the Lord said, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is concerning the parable of the talents, and those talents represent many things. One thing is the stewardships we have been given and the responsibilities in the kingdom that we have been given. In section 132, We read, For I am the Lord thy God, and ye shall obey my voice. And I give unto my servant Joseph that he shall be made ruler over many things, for he hath been faithful over a few things. And from henceforth I will strengthen him. These statements in Revelation, the book of Revelation, are particularly interesting for you and me. Where the Lord says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us. He's talking about those who are faithful and true to the covenants they have made with their Lord in his church and kingdom in the temples, who hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow. This is where we are reading temple language, right here in the book of Revelation. And as we've talked about before, the book of Revelation is written to the saints. They're the only ones who will really understand this. 
In chapter 5, verse 10 of Revelation, again it says, referring to Christ, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall, future tense, reign on the earth. Guess when that will begin? During the millennium. The most faithful who have lived faithful to their covenants and endured to the end in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints shall reign on the earth as kings and priests to God. How can that be? Well, guess what? Guess who else is going to be here during the millennium? Those of lower orders, even lower celestial orders, who did not live the fullness of the covenants, but at least the basics of the celestial covenant, and also those of the terrestrial kingdom, will live here upon the earth. They will need guidance, and this is the system that God has established. Revelation 3.21, the part we've read so many times, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sat down with my Father in his throne. Section 132, the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 19 through 20, lets us know that these highest gifts of ruling and reigning are those who have entered the eternal sealing covenant and have been faithful. And that these gifts will come not only in the millennium, as is indicated by the previous verses, but on throughout eternity. I highly recommend we review section 132, 19 through 20 on a regular basis that we may be reminded of the grand picture of what is going on here and our part in it. In verse 14, we have referred to verses 14 through 19 many times from our studies in the previous section. But let us review it again, since Satan has so much power on the earth right now, and he is the master of deception. He is the master of evils, and he paints those evils as righteousness. He makes them look good. And he makes that which is good look evil. He is so successful in that here in these latter days, as Babylon increases in strength, as as we near the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the Lord posts this warning. So verse 14, And again I will give unto you a pattern in all things, that ye may not be deceived. For Satan is abroad in the land, and he goeth forth deceiving the nations. Notice, plural. The nations is another way of saying all the people in this world. And they seem to be the majority right now. So if we're on the side of the majority, that could be a red flag. (laughs) If we understand the principles of the gospel of what the Lord teaches in contrast to what the world teaches. So here is... The formula, starting in verse 15, wherefore, by the way, just remembering Peter Johnson's talk in 2019, he kind of summarized Satan's strategy. It is through deception. I'm looking down here at the bullet points. He calls it the three Ds. Deception, which Satan is a master at. Distraction. That is the natural man. The natural man gets so distracted with all of our technology and our attention turns away from the study and our investment of time and talents in the Lord's kingdom and in his work. And then also discouragement. Those are three methods that Satan obtains great success among people, even among members of this church. So, starting in verse 15, Wherefore he that prayeth, whose spirit is contrite. It's easy to pray because we're supposed to pray, but not have a contrite spirit. We approach the Lord with our list of demands and expect him to answer them. That's not contrite. Whose spirit is contrite. It's another way of saying whose spirit is very humble realizing God has shown his love to us. It is now on our shoulders to show our love to him, 
to understand his eternal wisdom, to submit to his counsel, and to be striving to increase in the divine nature and be on that course. That's the kind of heart that makes all the difference in our prayers. Whose spirit is contrite, the same is accepted of me. And then on condition, if. Because it's possible to pray and to have a contrite spirit. Have you ever known people who do pray and they have contrite spirits, but when it comes to counsel, they just can't obey it. They want counsel, they ask for counsel, but they will not follow one word of it. I think we've all had experience with people like that. So the third ingredient here is obey mine ordinances. And in those ordinances are covenants. And the covenants are even beyond counsel. They are God's system that we covenant to align with that our characters will elevate to his as time passes. That third condition is essential. So verse 16, now it goes from he who prays to he who speaks. There's a lot of people out there speaking. There's a lot of people on YouTube and other methods of social media. They're doing a lot of speaking. There's a lot of opinions going out there. There's a lot of, a lot of arguments for one case or another. So verse 16 becomes essential. He that speaketh, again, whose spirit is contrite. Number two, whose language is meek and edifieth. Remember, we studied back in verse 50, edifieth. Edification takes place by the power of the Holy Ghost. People who in social media are angry and trying to do all these things through anger, that's the opposite of the power of the Holy Ghost. That's not edification. That's just an argument. And so the second qualification, whose language is meek and edifieth. The same is accepted of God on condition if he obey mine ordinances. Sometimes the loudest people in this world are those who do not obey the Lord's ordinances and are not meek and do not speak by the loving power of the Holy Ghost. And yet so many are persuaded by such characters. Verses 15 and 16 are so essential for each of us to discern good from evil, from God's ways and God's servants from all the other loud voices out there. Verse 17, And again, he that trembleth under my power shall be made strong and shall bring forth fruits of praise and wisdom according to the revelations and truths which I have given you. You is through his prophet. Verse 18 and 19, And again, he that is overcome and bringeth not forth fruits, even according to this pattern which we just read in these verses, is not of me. Wherefore, by this pattern... Ye shall know the spirits in all cases under the whole heavens. If there are any verses to mark in the scriptures to help us stay on that straight and narrow path, walking steadfastly and steadily toward the tree of life, these verses will help sure our footsteps and to discern from heavenly good from the Babylon's worldly evil and all of its tactics. Let's go clear over here to verse 37. A lot of names are mentioned here about who is going to be traveling to Missouri. It's interesting, I put a note here with Simmons' writer. Of these names that were mentioned at the time they were faithful, But yet, some of these people apostatize. For example, I'm going to just start over here with where it talks about Norman Brown. For example, Norman Brown left the church because his horse died on the trip to Zion. Probably figured, well, if there's a God, he wouldn't let my horse die. 
So he left. Joseph Wakefield withdrew after he saw Joseph Smith playing with the children upon coming down from his translating room. He just didn't think that a prophet playing with children was becoming of a prophet. Therefore, Joseph Smith was not a prophet of God. Preconceived ideas they had in their mind already defined according to some type of background information what they thought God was like, what they thought his servants were like, and when they saw reality did not match what they thought, they parted ways. They thought they could counsel God. Simmons Ryder lost faith in Joseph's inspiration when Ryder's name was misspelled in his commission to preach. Can you imagine? The prophet is just receiving this revelation where it tells, now let my servant Simmons Ryder go do this. And the prophet's just dictating it. The scribe is writing it. It's the scribe who misspelled it. And because of that, Simmons Ryder just thought, well, Joseph couldn't be a prophet if he allowed that mistake to slip through. Others left the church because they experienced economic difficulties. Ezra Booth, who also made this trip to Missouri, was a former Methodist minister. Now, he is a very interesting character. He was an influential apostate during this period. He joined the church in May 1831 when he saw the prophet heal the lame arm of Alice Johnson. Booth, along with other missionaries, was called and sent to Missouri in the summer of 1831. Upset about having to walk and preach the entire journey, he began to criticize and find fault with the leadership of the church. He was disappointed to arrive in Missouri and not experience manifestations of the Spirit, such as miracles and the gift of tongues, which he expected would increase his religious fervor. He returned to Hiram, Ohio, full of suspicion and fault-finding. On the way back, they were going down a river, and he was in the company of the prophet, and it was a hot, miserable, humid, sultry day, and they were just all frazzled. And, you know, even the best members of the church under circumstances like that get a little testy. And the others in the group were getting testy. They were getting fault-finding of each other. And even the prophet got a little testy himself. And Ezra Booth would not forgive Joseph Smith of that, that there was a human side of him. And Joseph later tried to get with him and said, I'm just so sorry. <laughs> it was just a miserable day, and I'm just so sorry that I, you know, this happened. But Ezra Booth would not forgive. The prophet observed that Booth had become disappointed when he actually learned that faith, humility, patience, and tribulation go before blessing, and that he must become all things to all men, that he might pre-adventure save some. Booth arrived in Hiram on the 1st of September and was excommunicated five days later. Soon he and Simmons Ryder publicly renounced their faith at a Methodist camp meeting at Urshalersville, a few miles southwest of Hiram. He then joins with another person who then publishes a book, and it becomes the first anti-Mormon book, where he sought to criticize everything he possibly could criticize, and it became a real challenge. It was this book, and those who were standing behind it and trying to defame the church that led Joseph Smith to write what we now read in Joseph Smith History. You'll find in the very first paragraph where Joseph Smith discusses the attempts by others to bring down the church, and it, he is referring to the efforts of Ezra Booth and others. 39 and 40 are very important for every one of us. Let the residue of the elders watch over the churches and declare the word in the regions round about them. And let them labor with their own hands that there be no idolatry nor wickedness practiced. It's interesting, he doesn't say adultery. He says idolatry. There's a significant difference, although people who get involved in idolatry are more susceptible 
to committing adultery. Idolatry is anything that places other things of this world before God and our work in the kingdom. Other things become our idol. Verse 40, And remember in all things the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted, for that he that doeth not these things, the same is not my disciple. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, And remembering together before the Lord the poor, the needy, and the oppressed, there is developed unconsciously but realistically a love for others above self, a respect for others, a desire to serve the needs of others. One cannot ask God to help a neighbor in distress without feeling motivated to do something oneself toward helping that neighbor. I heard a man of prominence say the other day, I have amended the language of my prayers. Instead of saying, Bless the poor and the sick and the needy, I now say, Father, show me how to help the poor and the sick and the needy, and give me resolution to do so. Even we go clear back to the Old Testament, and we find, even under the Mosaic Law, this was a core principle. As the Lord tells the members of the house of Israel to be mindful of the poor and the needy. As we're to do that on a personal basis and also on the organized ward and stake basis. But it's interesting to let us know, here put in blue, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. God can make everybody rich. But in his design and purpose, he allows the poor to be here among us. There's grand purpose, and it provides good, righteous opportunities for each of us. The phrasing that the Lord chooses in verse 42 and 43 is very interesting. Here they are in Kirtland, Ohio, and the Lord is talking about Zion over there in Missouri. Verse 42 and thus, even as I have said, if ye are faithful, ye shall assemble yourselves together to rejoice upon the land of Missouri, which is the land of your inheritance. And get this, they hadn't even been there yet. They didn't even know. The only people who had been there were Oliver Cowdery and, and Parley P. Pratt and Ziba Peterson. And I think one other I can't remember who made that missionary journey down there to teach the Indians on the western side of the Missouri River. Those are the only ones who had been there. The Lord says, speaking of that land, which is now the land of your enemies. Even then, the Lord knew that before he ever called them to go to Missouri. Although the Lord told the saints the land was currently occupied by enemies, he promised to hasten the city of Zion in its time. The Lord's reference to enemies of the saints foreshadowed the antagonism and hostility that church members would experience from local Missouri residents as they began to gather in Jackson County, Missouri. So verse 43, in light of the fact that God knew this, and by the way, remember the land of Israel was also possessed by enemies, the Canaanites. And as Moses led the children of Israel through the Sinai wilderness, as they approached the land of Israel, he sent spies into that land so that they could come back and report they came back and reported, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, Well, yes, they are a very large and powerful people. They have walled cities, but I know that with God we can conquer these people and that we will be successful if we will follow the words of our prophet and leader, Moses. The other ten, all they could do was talk about how tall and large and strong those people were who inhabited the land and how there was no way those tribes of Israel in the Sinai wilderness could stand a chance against them. The majority of people sided with the account and description of those ten people. It just shows how a person's attitude can change and affect the crowds. 
We see that so much today in what we read and what we hear in the media systems. A person's attitude can affect so many people. Here the Lord knew all about this. He knew it was going to be a trial for the saints, but he had grand purpose as foreshadowed in verse 43. But behold, I, the Lord, will hasten the city, and then get these three words, in its time, and will crown the faithful with joy and with rejoicing. He seems to indicate that there's going to be some trials coming up here, and maybe it's not going to be the first attempt to go to Missouri and settle it. But in its time, that's another words of saying in the Lord's time when the saints are ready, because going to the real estate of Zion is a completely different matter than a Zion-like people inhabiting that real estate. That is so vital to understand. And the mission of the church right now, I should say part of its mission, is to invite as many people of this earth in mortality and in the spirit world, to come into the church and to become a Zion people. Those who will do so, and apparently not everyone will, but those who will do so and be striving to that end can one day qualify to help establish that city in righteousness. It will have the power of God over all the enemies of planet Earth. For God will come down from heaven because of their great faith and manifest his power in their behalf. Let's go to section 53 now. Sidney Gilbert is asked to forsake the world here in verse 2. Elder Ballard said over here starting in this, well maybe I should read the comment just before the Lord's commandment to forsake the world did not mean that Sidney was to isolate himself from the world. By the way, Sidney Gilbert was a merchant there and with Brother Whitney. And he, after saw Brother Whitney come into the church, that he wanted to know more and he was converted to the gospel also. He served greatly. He had his weaknesses as we all do, but he was a very important servant in the kingdom and then the restoration of the gospel. Elder Ballard said, In the church we often state the couplet, Be in the world, but not of the world. Perhaps we should state the couplet as two separate admonitions. First, be in the world, be involved, be informed. Try to be understanding and tolerant and to appreciate diversity. Make meaningful contributions to society through service and involvement. Second, be not of the world. Do not follow wrong paths or bend to accommodate or accept what is not right. In spite of all the wickedness in the world and in spite of all the opposition to good that we find on every hand, we should try to take ourselves or our children out of the world. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven or yeast. We are to lift the world and help all to rise above the wickedness that surrounds us. Verse 7 And again I would that ye should learn that he only is saved who endureth to the end. If the Lord says that, that's something, that's a phrase that we na- need to take serious. As we, through church history, find that there were some who were once so faithful, but did not endure to the end. We will see how the Lord will judge them. We will see how he will handle them when they go into the spirit world, and how much or to what level his mercy will apply to them. But somehow, to turn around and to leave this world not being faithful to the Lord in his kingdom is a very serious matter. And again, remember that enduring to the end means in following the example of the Son of the living God. President Thomas S. Monson said, My brothers and sisters, may we have a commitment to our Heavenly Father that does not ebb and flow with the years of the crisis of our lives. We should not need to experience difficulties for us to remember Him. 
and we should not be driven to humility before giving him our faith and trust. Let me just read a little historical background for section 54. As the saints began to settle on his property, Lehman Copley traveled with other missionaries to Northern Union, Ohio, to preach the gospel to the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Perry and the Shakers. We studied this in section 49. Well, we'll kind of skip down through here. The leader of that group, by the name of Ashbel Kitchell, the Shaker leader, and together they went to Lehman's farm and told the saints that they had to leave. See, Lehman Copley apostatized because he decided to stick with the Shakers instead of fully embracing the gospel. Lehman broke the covenant he had made with the Lord to consecrate his farm. Joseph Knight Jr. recorded that in spite of making improvements on Lehman's land during the brief time that the saints lived there, we had to leave Copley's farm and pay $60 damage. Not knowing what to do, Newell Knight from the New York Colesville branch, that faithful group of people, not knowing what to do, Newell Knight and the other elders from the Colesville group went to the prophet for guidance. Joseph inquired of the Lord on June 10, 1831, and received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 54. Newell Knight has a very interesting history. Remember, he was the one who, before he joined the church, was possessed of the devil. In fact, here's the account, and this is directly from uh, Who's Who in the Doctrine and Covenants that I highly recommend, written by Susan Easton Black. Let's just review this to get a better appreciation for Brother Knight. As the prophet visited with the Knight family in April 1830, he noticed Newell's hesitation to vocally pray. Joseph encouraged him, but Newell's attempt while alone in the woods was unsuccessful. When he returned home, the experience triggered a violent physical struggle. The prophet Joseph, who was summoned to the scene by Newell's alarmed wife, found that Newell's facial appearance and limbs had become distorted and twisted in every shape, and his body was finally caught up off the floor and tossed about most fearfully. Newell pleaded with the prophet to cast the devil out of him, to which the prophet replied, If you know that I can, it shall be done. He commanded the devil in the name of Jesus Christ to depart, and miraculously Newell's body returned to normal. Newell saw the devil leave him and vanish from his sight. As he rested from the ordeal, a vision of the heavens caused him to levitate. He recorded, I now begin to feel a most pleasing sensation resting upon me, and immediately the visions of heaven were open to my view. I felt myself attracted upward. I found that the Spirit of the Lord had actually caught me up off the floor, and that my shoulder and head were pressing against the beams. Can you imagine the other people in the room watching this? Well, Newell was baptized on May 8, 1830, at the Whitmer Farm. He declared that during the first conference of the church held the next month, he said, I saw the heavens open. I beheld the Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. As the year 1830 ended, he wrote, Great things have transpired, too great for pen to paint. He was faithful and true throughout his entire life. He makes a, a statement and a comment here about how terribly he felt when the prophet and Hiram were martyred there in Carthage. His allegiance to the prophet was so strong, he followed Brigham and the rest of the Quorum of the Twelve. But he unfortunately died in the journey. And he left his wife and children and Lydia was his wife, a widow with seven young children, wondered why he had left her. According to her history, she wrote of a revelation received from Newell. She said as she spoke, he stood by her side with a lovely smile on his face and said, Be calm, let not sorrow overcome you. It was necessary that I should go. I was needed behind the veil to represent the true condition of this camp and people. You cannot fully comprehend it now, but the time will come when you shall know why I left you and our little ones. Therefore dry up your tears, be patient, and I will go before you and protect you in your journeyings. 
and you and your little ones shall never perish for lack of food. We will skip section 55. This is just after William W. Phelps joined the church and is immediately called to help serve as a printer with those others who are involved in printing things for the church and also to write books for little children so that they could be schooled in their young years. Section 56 is the last one that we will look at today. The Lord reprimands Ezra Thayer in this section. Ezra Thayer had a wonderful conversion to the church. He had beautiful manifestations as he read the Book of Mormon, as he heard testimony from Hiram Smith of the Book of Mormon. It was just beautiful and wonderful. But his actual involvement in the church, he had his failings. And one time when he was called to serve, he was very faithful in many callings, but one time when he was called to serve, there was something that went on that we don't fully have record about that the Lord chastened him very strongly in this section and taught principles that even though we have a wonderful testimony by the power of the Holy Ghost, we can disappoint the Lord if we're asked to do something and we don't follow through. We can repent and do better next time. In verses 14 and 15, he talks about people who even in the church seek to counsel in their own ways. Remember how strong the Lord feels about that from section 1, where he talks about that people seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way after the image of his own God. We need to remember how the Lord feels about that. He talks about people whose hearts are not satisfied. They will not obey truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. He talks about woe unto the rich that will not give your substance to the poor for your riches will canker your souls and this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation and of judgment of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended and my soul is not saved. Woe unto you poor men whose hearts are not broken, whose, whose spirits are not contrite, whose bellies are not satisfied, and whose hands are not stayed from laying hold upon other men's goods, whose eyes are full of greediness, and who will not labor with your own hands. But then he speaks about blessed are the poor who are pure in heart, whose hearts are broken, and whose spirits are contrite. Though the Lord does not address the rich, he has addressed it in other passages of Scripture. Let's just take a look at a few passages in 1 Timothy and Alma. The Apostle Paul wrote, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. We know of the account where Christ admonished a young rich man to forsake all of all of his riches and to sell it to the poor. But in other passages, we find that the Lord does not tell all rich people to do that. And here we get the principle behind that in Alma 62 and also Alma 1. Alma 62 says, And the people of Nephi began to prosper again in the land, and began to multiply and wax exceedingly strong again in the land, and they began to grow exceedingly rich. But notwithstanding their riches, or their strength, or their prosperity, they were not lifted up in the pride of their eyes. Neither were they slow to remember the Lord their God, but they did humble themselves exceedingly before him. Yea, they did remember how great things the Lord had done for them. And then the last passage for today, from Alba chapter 1. And now, because of the steadiness of the church, they began to be exceedingly rich, having abundance of all things, whatsoever they stood in need and abundance of flocks and herds and fatlings of every kind, and also abundance of grain and of gold and of silver and of all precious things and abundance of silk and fine twined linen and all manner of good homely cloth. And thus in their prosperous circumstances 
they did not send away any who were naked or that were hungry or that were athirst or that were sick or that had not been nourished, and they did not set their hearts upon riches. Therefore they were liberal to all, both old and young, bond and free, both male and female, whether out of the church or in the church, having no respect to persons as to those who stood in need, and thus they did prosper. If you were able to hear the message of the film that I showed earlier, you'll see that the church welfare program is designed to that very end, and we are all contributors to that program, hopefully. These principles bring us great joy and happiness as we immerse our hearts and our souls into them. It's one of the great blessings of obeying the Lord and doing our stewardship the Lord's way. It is a foundation for true peace, even in these amazing latter days. This gospel is true, and the principles the Lord teaches are true and bring deep inner joy that cannot be found any other way. I bear my witness of these things, and I do so in the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.